So uh, first we're going to do some introductions. Uh, my name is Christopher Newland. I am a cloud architect with Red Hat. Um, prior to that, I was uh, just a general architect in our services. Uh, I've been working in the container space for about 10 years now, starting with OpenVZ with the uh, US Department of Energy. Uh, after that, I've been moving on from different microservices to now focusing more on modernization and migrations. So I'm an, also an ambassador of the conveyor community. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Valentina. I'm from Red Hat. Uh, I'm a principal architect. I focus on adoption and application development. And it's my pleasure to be here today. My name is Jared Burke. I'm a managing architect with Red Hat. I've been here with 12 years based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, I focus on all things containers and application migrations. Hi, uh, James Bench, Vice President of our Digital Practice in Technology Consulting Services. Uh, we do a lot of digital transformation work, agile transformation, low code, no code, and then uh, you know full stack software engineering in both the .NET and uh, Java platforms. All right, so a little bit about the community that uh, is sponsoring us. So we're here representing Conveyor. Uh, Conveyor is a CNCF um, community and project. So there is a tool called Conveyor. Uh, you may have heard some of the other tools. Uh, there, if you've heard things like Crane and Tackle, Move to Cube, uh, these were all projects that were under the Conveyor community umbrella. Uh, I'm happy to announce today that we've consolidated that. So our new website, conveyor.io, uh, the the big new version of that just went out last week. And along with that, uh, we are consolidating the projects down to one, uh, simply called Conveyor. So if you're familiar with the Tackle tool, that has been rebranded. And then things, some of the things around the Conveyor community have been either moved inside of that single tool or have been discontinued. So um, we're, we're putting all of our eggs in one basket, especially from what we're hearing is the most beneficial to this particular community. So definitely check out conveyor.io for all of the uh, updates there. And um, this talk specifically is going to be uh, really like a fireside chat on just migrations. Uh, we'll just talk about our experiences. Uh, all of us have been doing this for a long time. Uh, some ways that the conveyor tool can be incorporated in that and a lot of just lessons learned from large enterprise migrations uh, from a variety of different sources. So this could be containers moving from on-prem to um, into the cloud or it could be uh, all the way from going from a mainframe application all the way to being cloud ready. So a variety of different experiences and things that we'll be talking about today. So uh, we did uh, ask our community some questions before coming. So the way this talk is going to work is that I have some predefined questions that have been sent to us and we're gonna spend about half to three fourths of the time going over those questions. But then we're gonna open it up to the audience. So if you have a question, I'll let you know. Uh, we'll be starting Q&A a little bit earlier, probably in some of the other talks, just to give you, the audience, some opportunities to ask our panelists some questions. But uh, I'm going to start with uh, Valentina. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges enterprises face when taking on a cloud native migration? That's a great question. Um, so the first thing that I have seen when working with customers are when they focus on modernization as a only one time thing, instead of seeing it as a journey. So when you embrace modernization as a journey, you start looking at different things and not only technology. You look at people, processes, and technology. When looking at people, you will look at, for example, do I have the right skills? Do I need to train my people? And with processes, do I have the right methodologies? How all those fit together to create in a plan. The second thing that I have seen uh, that is critically important is understanding why we are doing this, why containers are important, what is the value for my business. So we have seen that containers uh, brings a lot of value from increasing uh, security, reliability, uh, high availability, 
also accelerating your software development life cycle. How all those values connect into your business, creating a story that really aligns to your mission and to your vision, and communicating that back into your company at all levels. When you speak at a company and everyone really gets the value, not, you not only get the alignment, but also the commitment, the inspiration, the motivation behind it. I have seen that sometimes customers see uh, this as a uh, Periodity, right? When you focus, when you're working with feature development, you are always competing with periodities. But when customers understand the value and they have this articulated to all the different levels, that is, uh, it's just a different game on, on the modernization. It's just competing completely different and they are able to move forward when those uh, periodizations are having problems. Um, the other thing that is very important is when you create the why, you really create a plan that connects to it and look at uh, to create metrics that can measure back into the why. So if you're saying, well, for me it's important to reduce costs, so how you can measure back that you are really getting that value from your modernization. And that is when you really yeah. get successful. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, where are some areas that people can start? Uh, when, so let's say that someone is in the planning stages uh, very early on of uh, enterprise migration. Uh, what are some of the considerations they should be taking when they're starting this journey? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a great question again. So we were talking as a team again the importance of um, having once you have that vision articulated to everyone, create some working groups. So ensuring that everyone on the room, whoever needs to be involved from developers to platform engineers and DevOps are aligned and I'm working on early stages. But then you may be wondering like, how should I start? Like where to start? That's what everyone is asking. And um, the important thing is creating, we call it a pilot project. So you create a pilot project to start measuring what you want to obtain. What is important for your company now to start working on any modernization? Is it uh, sometimes customers are concerned about the time that it will take me to modernize? How, uh, how much time it will take me? So we take an application that maybe has a lot of complexity. Maybe you want to prove the business that this has value. So you look, uh, you work on a line of, line of business and choose an application that is important and critical for them. So depends on your criteria and what you want to prove, you will select one or a set of applications to measure back. This will help you not only to understand, reduce complexity, reduce risk, provide value, but also how you can plan back into your whole modernization journey. So create, after that, create, uh, a sort, not, don't try to do everything at once, create a plan with phases, and that will help you to see where should I start. Should I start with a more complex one that I already resolve, um, looking at similar archetypes, like I have job applications that maybe I want to focus on, or should I want to work with this line of business that I know modernization is, is very important for them. Uh, the other thing that is very important, Conveyor has a way that you can uh, set up all of these. But the other thing that developers are wondering is how do I know if my application is ready to move into containers? And this is where uh, uh, Conveyor has a really good way to create different paths. It depends on where you are to show you where do you want to go and how much Suscus changes do you need to do in your Java application. So Conveyor is a really great way I have been using with customers. Yeah. It saves yep. a lot of time. It provides a, yeah, amazing features. Yes, I think we are in time. Yeah. So uh, Chris, I will ask you, you've been working a lot with customers as well. What mm -hmm. are the non-technical challenges that you have seen uh, when working with them? I think going off some of the conversations uh, and give some some examples of some of the things you were talking about, especially you know who who is in the room at the beginning. You know, do we have the right people on day one? Uh, usually, what I find the answer is no. Uh, that you know when we ask different organizations about their migration efforts, you know they'll usually bring in the the networking guy, maybe an app dev guy, and then you know someone maybe from um, from the security team. Uh, it, it takes a lot more people usually. A lot of times you're not thinking of all your stakeholders. There might be an organization that uh, isn't directly involved but may have direct impact on your migration. Uh, the biggest example I can give, um, especially in a lot of industries, there's some types of policies that are driving certain restrictions. Uh, so the, the things that come to example are um, healthcare, 
government, uh, finance, all these have some type of governing body that has, has certain policies that you're needing to meet to, um, to effectively drive security and other things within your organization. A lot of times these things aren't known, especially if you're running on-prem and you're going into the cloud. A lot of times when you're moving into the cloud, you're having to take more things into consideration. So geography becomes a very big issue. I know for me, when I've worked in the energy sector, um, we've had things all on-prem within the United States. Well, when we were moving to the cloud, there was times where we were moving things to Singapore or even Russia or China, and we had to be very careful. Um, in healthcare in the United States, we have HIPAA, uh, and that's the governing body over how, how certain information is shared. So um, PKI, personal information, that becomes a big key. And a lot of times there's people within your organization who manage these policies that you may not even be aware of. Uh, I always recommend to try to hunt those people down because more often I see these type of things derailing migrations for three months, six months, a year, or sometimes even putting projects completely on hold. So these are some of the things to be being considering. Uh, with that, I have a question uh, for Jared. Uh, really just comes right into what I was just talking about. <laughs> Who and what within my organization should be involved early on when planning a large scale enterprise migration? That's a really important question, Chris. And to answer that, I think you need to think about um, who some of those folks are, right? And when you are planning those, we have some of those uh, people are things like your business leaders, uh, unit leads, uh, application owners, uh, architects, uh, operations and support, uh, cloud native teams, uh, specific platform teams such as your computer infrastructure teams, uh, your storage teams, your networking teams, uh, security. Notice there's a lot of folks that are involved in that, right? And it's not just the people that you need to have involved early on to be successful in large scale migrations. You also need to think about the, what those people can bring to the table, right? Uh, thinking about what the analysis and, uh, and assessment phase is going to be like, understanding those data requirements, what those people can bring to the table in order to be able to connect to the why, right? Understanding what those business requirements and, and business needs really are. What is that data from the application perspective, right? So when we start to think about that, what these people can bring to the table, we're talking about what's the general, what's the general application? What does it actually do? What about the archi application architecture? Uh, mm. You're going to need to know how it operates, right? What is the, its uh, operating life cycle? How does it perform? Its, its performance characteristics? Does it have, uh, a, what's its software life cycle, right? Uh, what, what type of life cycle does it have? Um, is it res how resilient does it be? Is it a single app is, or is it high availability deployed in multiple regions? Um, security and compliance are also important. And databases and dependencies, right? The, and you can see there's a lot of areas of data that you have to go get with a lot of different people. In order to be able to get to gather that data, leveraging a tool like Conveyor can help you get away from spreadsheets, doing, having to organize that data, being able to collect it in a very uh, organized, uh, methodical way, and then take the data that you've collected from the people and the requirements and be able to start to do the analysis and, uh, and uh, assessment phase and plan that migration so that you can uh, begin to continually um, understand what the various uh, priorities are, think of the R's, and determine which of your application portfolio needs to actually be migrated, can be retired, or replatformed or others. Nice, thank you, Jared. So, uh, James, I know you've, you've been doing this a very long time. Um, you've been involved with you know, different federal agencies in the US and, and things in commercial space. Um, what are some of the lessons learned that you found, you know, after you've done these types of large scale migrations that you wish you had known beforehand or different approaches that you have taken? Yeah, there are things that uh, it's really easy to underestimate. So when you're thinking about a large migration and again, think, think big, think an entire, you know, critical business function that has departments tied to it nearly, it's so important to the you know, the enterprise that it basically has its own IT, dedicated IT infrastructure associated to it, IT staff is dedicated to it. So think of something that is that tightly woven and core. Some of the, the biggest challenge that was easy to underestimate was how much of a culture change that it actually takes from an IT governance perspective. So when you're 
doing this, you know, transition, let's say into cloud native, you know, Kubernetes and Docker, you have to introduce so much more kind of technology that is not in the approved software list. Uh, and normally there is a process if you're in large enterprise IT where security has to go through, you know, approve it, scan it, and they do that process for each and every product you're needing to introduce to actually get this launched. So at the very beginning, you have to really take stock of the inventory that you're having, and you need to make sure that you work with them to kind of change how they perceive what does secure software actually look like. And knowing that if you're you know, building now into you know, a DevSecOps capability, that all of the scanning layers that you're doing all of that will actually provide what they're really needing is to know that is there something vulnerable that you're introducing into the ecosystem. And I think if you can help convey that early on, very early on, um, that'll help, you know, kind of over, you know, overcome kind of one of the key roadblocks is really, do, are you on the approved software list? Classic governance processes around release management. When you're transforming, you know, into this type of capability, you're able to deploy much deploy much more frequently. You're able to remediate things mm -hmm. faster. You're able to, you know, take production issues and recover them quickly uh, because you have this now a new capability to, to deploy. But if you have formalized, you know, kind of classic enterprise IT governance processes around deployments, that process really slows down. And a lot of it ends up being, again, education early on where you have to sh tell them or show them that actually security is completely baked into our entire build process, our deployment process, there's checks and balances. We can measure the hash of what we built, the image that we built, and actually what made it into production. All of those controls are now baked in completely. And so again, what was the point of having all of those controls in the first place was to ensure that that was happening. But now it's completely baked into the entire life cycle. And so now that paradigm has to change and it comes with a lot of education. So underestimated that, that hurt. That's hurt before, so we tackle that kind of early on. And then the other one is the development team. If the team has been working on that kind of monolithic application for a long period of time, when you're moving into this entire paradigm, Agile tends to have to kind of come along with it. And so transitioning them to kind of an Agile you know, methodology and approach, tying that Agile methodology into your deployment process, uh, into your build process, all of that takes a lot of culture change. and so. Don't underestimate, you know, kind of needing to kind of stack that up front uh, when you're doing the planning process. The, another kind of key lesson learned was really around security. 100% bring them in, bring your security officer in as early as possible. So yes. the security yep. office has to essentially manage the enterprise security kind of across the board. And so they're not going to be the experts on what is Kubernetes, what is DevSecOps, you know, how, how are all these security scanning layers work? Maybe I'm just doing one scanning tool on the OS, you know, layer, but I'm not really understanding like all the different layers now that can be scanned and I can provide a security, you know, uh, footprint at any moment of time. So because they don't understand all of that or the number of ports that had to be open, which is far less than what it was before, just really all of that education, we end up having to do a lot of training early on in the security officers that are, security officers that are gonna do the assessments uh, and really help teach them what does it look like to have a scaling infrastructure? What does it, what does it mean to have you know, this kind of capability? So having them on almost on day one through the entire migration uh, has been critical to kind of like some key successes. And then the kind of the last one I'll highlight is uh, if you've worked in a large enterprise application for a long period of time, uh, you'll have your pet peeves, you'll have your tech debt that you know you've been sitting on for a long time, and you'll want to want to you'll want to tackle all of that tech debt as part of the migration. That is a very slippery slope that can actually lead you into some trouble. Uh, what you really need to make sure is that you have functional parity between your current application and then your migrated version of the application. Be very particular about which tech that you're going to tackle, mm -hmm. which one you're really going to have to refactor or not refactor. The, be, be mindful of like what do you really need to do to actually make it into the new paradigm. Once you're there, you will have you know, a new development capability, a faster way to resolve, and then you can tackle the functional tech that instead of the core ones that you had to tackle to move it into the new uh, environment. Nice. Thank you, James. So we'll move over to our Q&A here in a second, but um, I want to do some summarizing what we've been hearing 
uh, I, you know, two major takeaways, I think you and something I always tell my clients on day one when we're talking about large enterprise migra uh, migrations like this, is that migrations are usually more of a people problem than a technology problem. So I'll repeat that. Migrations are more of a people problem than a technology problem. It's about identifying the people who are in the room to begin with day one and identifying the people who are not in the room day one who need to be there. It's very important to have organizational buy-in throughout your entire organization. Even if you think a business unit doesn't have anything to do with your migration, they should at least be aware because there might be some things that you're not aware of, of how they have some uh, stake in what your operations are doing. Another big thing is just try to do the most analysis you can up front. The more information you have about your applications and you know your current platform and the platform you're moving into, the more you're going to be able to pivot and make critical decisions along your migration path. Um, but yeah, no, those are all great things. I think that we're, we're showing more and more from your experiences that this really does end up being very much a people problem a lot of times, you know, who's, who's involved up front. So I am open for, um, for questions from the audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions for us? And I'll just go ahead and repeat. Um, so if you could speak up and I can just repeat it back for the camera. Okay, we do have a couple of questions uh, that were submitted in. So I am going to take a look at the next one there. Uh, Jared, I have one for you. Sure. So there's a trend with more and more migrations going into managed services for Kubernetes. So things like EKS, AKS, oh, um, Red Hat's Rosa. What are some of the complexities you're seeing in these types of migrations from maybe the traditional on-prem migrations we've been seeing prior? Well, a lot of that gets to where you're starting from. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, a lot of it, uh, the managed services help actually kind of get you started uh, earlier because you don't have to worry about as much of the infrastructure, uh, to, it can, it getting it up and running faster. Um, again, it comes back down to having knowing your why, being able to understand um, your reasoning, uh, uh, learning and adapting uh, from that and, and improving on those. As you um, on-prem, you start to have uh, typically more security requirements. You happen to things that are not uh, always as uh, are uh, as organized, right? Uh, things we have, don't always have the right people. You don't always have the right applications. And so what ends, what ends up happening on-prem, you tend to have more challenges. Um, uh, and, and especially if you're going from on-prem to the cloud, it's easier to go from on the cloud back to on-prem. You tend to have more security uh, controls that you can put in place on on-prem than you do in the cloud. So that's really what, where some of your major challenges come in is, is that security, making sure that your applications can run in the more uh, less secure environment than typically your enterprise environments. Um, using uh, tools uh, such as Conveyor can help you understand your applications, uh, what complexities that they have in them, the dependencies, security challenges, and what changes you may need to make in order to be able to deploy uh, in your target environment, such as RESO or ARO. Thank you, Jared. Uh, just doing a time check, uh, how much time do we have? OK. Thank you. Uh, we have a question right here. Can you, yeah, can you come up and then I'll repeat the question? Actually, I'll just give you the microphone. You're coming all the way up. Thank you. Yeah, this might be easier. Am I loud enough? Um, right, so you mentioned that it's not a, uh, so much a technology problem as it is an information problem. Uh, so, oh, sorry, as it is a people problem. So by that, is it a question of distributing the information, getting the right information to right people? Or is it a question of uh, getting people to buy in and basically persuading them to make this decision instead of that decision? That's a great question. And to answer, it, it is both. Uh, the one that I see more often is an information issue. So usually there's been some organizational buy-in um, and it could be that someone is seeing an email or heard at a meeting at a high, so like a director level or managerial level that they knew this migration is coming. So from there, there's, there's buy-in. They're not saying, no, let's not do this. Uh, but then from an information standpoint, it's more that that person doesn't know how maybe their, their business unit interfaces with 
the operations of, of your um, your infrastructure team or your DevOps team. And that's usually something that's known by like a, a tech lead or a business analyst who, from this other business unit who thinks it's not involved, they're not having the right conversations or they're having the right information to be able to say, hey, actually, we have some stake in this. Maybe there's a legacy application or there's a policy or there's um, we have a, an old application that ties back to this you know, mainframe that you're retiring. Um, it's things like that which I usually see tripping things up. And then like I gave the, the beginning, it's a policy issue too. Maybe there's someone that's making policies like in healthcare and you think your your team is good because you've checked off all these things on, on, on a box, maybe a form or a document where maybe you don't know that things are changing in two months from the policy person and that person then comes in and says, hey, wait, this, this is all changing January 1st. We got to pull the brakes. Um, from a buy-in perspective, this one's a little bit more rare, but I have seen this often where uh, a particular business unit has decided to make a migration and they have not actually gotten buy-in from other groups. This is usually like a networking group or maybe a storage group who are unaware of the migration but are a critical part of the migration. These are the types of things if I'm seeing day one, I'm usually like, we need, to, we need to stop this meeting right now. Tomorrow, you are going to bring your storage person, your networking person, your security person, and we are going to have a much more in-depth conversation. And this needs to be going up to your, your CTO, to your even potentially your CEO, about trying to get more buy-in because right now you're on a path of destruction. This is not going to work out. And that is a conversation, unfortunately, I have to have with many clients. Does that answer your question? Are we at time? Five minutes? Okay. Uh, one of the other questions was, oh, right here. Hello, uh, thanks for doing that. Uh, so I have a question about failed migrations. Uh, so you've been doing it a long time. Have you experienced any learnings from that? Uh, I I have not failed a migration, so that's why I'm up here. But <laughs> but I'm usually picking up after usually multiple attempts of failed migrations, um, where they tend to where they have fallen over, right? Which is where you know you end up picking up from. Is a little bit of kind of the question that was earlier asked is um, when when you're doing this effort, right? There's a lot of gates that end up needing to be you know kind of past before you can actually end up in production like full you know in full production security ends up being one of those kind of gates where if you don't really give them the education and get their kind of understanding about what it, you know how that is on really at the early stages that in you know that from my experience is usually the place that projects get killed uh, they won't actually engage security they'll go ahead and do the implementation technically correct right technically built the right thing and then as they go for the security assessment to actually be uh, authorized to go in a production environment uh, they get they get stomped down and then they get delayed for months on end trying to then catch up and educate security on how to do it what does it mean that it's secure where is all the logs being captured and where does that get sent you know how do i manage my cvs oh we do we do images now what is that you know um, getting them in early. So security ends up usually being the area that gets stuck. The other area that a project can fail, and usually they fail because you run out of time of waiting. So you'll build the solution, it technically probably works, but you won't get enough approvals to actually get it out the door, and then time will pass, and then funding dries up, interest dries up, and the project ends up falling over. The other one was the IT governance component, making sure that you get all that approved software in early. Uh, many of my clients are full-on enterprise organizations, uh, it could take three months to get one new piece of software introduced into the enterprise. And in these types of things, when you're introducing this much new stuff, you're talking dozens, dozens and dozens of new software that you'd have to do that you typically would have to, each one would take, you know, three months. So making sure you group that together, you're doing that early on. So you're just getting ahead of these major time killers that will pretty much strangle out a project and have it fail. Yeah, I want to add uh, as well uh, this great answer. Um, 
the other problem that we have seen is scalability. So you need to look at scalability from every point. Wherever you are now, how you can scale from even in the infrastructure. Do I have enough infrastructure to accommodate all the workloads that I'm expecting? How I can manage that multi-cluster strategy or hybrid cloud strategy? And the other problem that we have seen is in terms of developers and DevOps, sometimes the, the companies start not with the right tooling or the right approach or the right templates, and they end that spending a lot of time trying to recreate things that the industry has solved already. So if you are just getting started, uh, I guess you were into the woods and hear about what's going on there. So learn about what the industry is, is doing, then try to recreate something that someone already solved and use best practices and think, will this be scaling in my company? And having the right methods, it will help a lot. Uh, what we have seen from customers is reaching out because they have those problems. I don't know how I can move forward because I don't have templates to, I don't know, deploy my applications, or these templates are broken, or doesn't work, or where I even can find the documentation, or how I can be trained. So all that's all the factors that we have seen really slowing down and breaking on the motivation on the people. So wanted to add that. Thank you. Yes, that was a great question. Thank you. I think we're coming up to time. Uh, so I just uh, appreciate all of you being here. Uh, I do ask that if you can, please give us a review on our talk. Uh, this data is very, very important. It helps us know how to improve as speakers, but it also helps us know what you know, CNCF is looking for when we're giving these types of talks for the conveyor community. So uh, please, please, this is really important to us. Uh, this type of feedback is a, is a big impact on you know, how we do our talks to come. So thank you for being here. Uh, I do appreciate the Conveyor community for sending us as well. And uh, have safe journeys home. Thank you.